सो वेलकम एवरी वन थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग सो बिफोर वी स्टार्ट लेट अस कंटिन्यू विद द कंटेम्प्लेशन विद द म्यूजिक एंड मंत्रा एंड मदर्स पिक्चर सो फॉर टू मिनट्स वील जस्ट स्टे विद दिस Yes, so we are on week twenty-five, and uh, we have two prayers today. Let us see if we do both of them, or maybe only one. So we start with March twenty-four, nineteen fourteen. So would anyone want to read it out aloud for all of us? Thank you. Yeah. March twenty-four. Nineteen fourteen. The result of all my reflections of yesterday is the finding that the only disturbance I experience comes from my fear of not having been or of not being perfectly identified with Thy law, and this disturbance comes precisely from the fact that the identification is not complete. For it is, if it were, I could not ask myself whether it is so. And on the other hand, as I know from experience, all disturbance would become impossible for me. But in face of an error or blunder, the true thought to have is not to say to oneself, "I should have done better. I should have done this instead of that." But rather, I was not sufficiently identified with the eternal consciousness. I must try to realize better this definite and integral union. Yesterday afternoon. During those long hours of silent contemplation, I understood at last what is meant by true identification with the object of one's thought. I touched this realization, as it were, not by achieving a mental state, but simply through steadiness and control of thought. I understood that I would need long, very long hours of contemplation to be able to perfect this realization. This con uh, this is one of the things I expect from the journey to India. If indeed thou dost dost uh, consider it useful for thy service, Lord, my progress is slow, very slow. 
but I hope that in compensation, it may be lasting and free from all fluctuation. Grant that I may accomplish my mission, that I may help in thy integral manifestation. Thank you. Yeah, so any thoughts, anyone? Any reflections? Yeah, so uh, I have not read this prayer. You had sent it, but I just read it now. And uh, it was so apt because exactly as your mother says, you know, I had disturbances and I was thinking, you know, I should have done better. I should have not. This was exactly my thoughts. And it was almost like mother is talking to me and, you know, helping me understand that, you know, like uh, I'm not perfectly identified with, uh, you know, the divine law and a lot of work to be done. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, beautiful. Yes. Yes. Yeah, anyone else? Anything to share? Anyone? Hi, Monika Ji, Jishnu here. Yeah, Namaste Jishnu Ji. Yeah. <clears throat> when I read this, two things mm -hmm. came to my mind. One is, and as this prayer is written in 1914, mother detailed some of the concepts which she, she told here much later. One is to the school students, I remember she said, when they asked that what is the way how we can do a thing at a short period of time or shorter, more efficiently, and her answer was what we call in modern terminology, the mindfulness. That is, you remember an offer. She said, the moment you concentrate fully and you remember an offer, first thing happens is you take less time. And second, the quality of the work that you do is much superior when you are not so consecrated. When I read this prayer, when, rather when I was reflecting on this prayer, that came to my mind that mother is saying that instead of we, of course she is speaking from her point of view, but instead when we are doing, instead of we thinking what we can do, what we should do, that is to run around. On, on the other hand, instead of doing that, if we consecrate ourselves to the higher force, Whoever, whatever faith we are and if we try to offer whatever we are doing consciously then the quality will improve and the things will change the meaning to that also then the student asked and there is a response from both mother and Shurabindu the student asked that but we forget we forget to offer when once we start doing a thing we forget then we realize that uh, we have not offered to you, but to offer to the divine, and then we realize. So to that, Mother said that this constant remembrance and offering is the summit. That's the aim that we are aiming for. We have to start. We have to start somewhere, and then we have to see uh, that how we are progressing. And Sri said about this, that it is first bet I mean, it is acceptable first that if you can remember at the beginning and at the end. And he spoke very like a scientist. He said it is fine if you can remember at the beginning and the end and later this period of remembrance will expand. So this is what struck me very, uh, it struck to me that mother is probably writing about this which she wrote or spoke in much details later. The second thing is also very interesting is she is speaking about this. Uh, just come down to the last para. Yesterday afternoon during these long hours, I touched this realization as it were not by achieving a mental state, but simply through a steadiness and control of thought. And this is something which mother is speaking here is the knowledge by identity. 
when we try to understand something, like we, we can try to do it by a mental logic. At times we can learn from our past experience, which is also memory. But there is a other way, which is you identify with that object so much that you become or you obtain those qualities or you, you get that. And I am unable to explain because unless one has that experience or even a partial glimpse of that experience, it is difficult to explain. Here too, mother said, I think the students were asking about the different modes of concentration. She said that there are two, three ways of concentration. And one way is you just identify, you just concentrate on the object. And at one point of time, you will see that you have become that object. There is, rather she did not use the term you have. She said that there is no division between the object and the you. And there is, you have become one. And that is the first thing that she is saying here that probably at that point of time, mother is just showing us that how long it takes. At that time, she is, she is saying that it is not yet perfect. And that is something that she wants to gain from the India trip when she meets sure window. But that is the second thing which started. And this, uh, we all know that mother had occult knowledge. She could gain understanding of the things through occult ways. But Sri Aurobindo has very clearly and humbly spoke about himself. And she, he said that I have not studied any occult science. But Sri Aurobindo had this natural, and he would say that when he was in Alipujal, he said that he had no sense of art beforehand and he said when i was at alipur jail as one day when i looked at the wall i saw as if this this form of symbols arts and etc they are becoming meaningful to me there are some lines in savitri i'm unable to find right now or recall but if we see where shravinda is saying that things which seemed meaningless or fragile frivolous suddenly they become symbols to us. That is when the psychic awakes or the inner being awakes, they become symbols or they become connections to, to the real meaning, what is there behind that thing. And that is the second thing which I find so interesting that here mother is speaking about the her elementary ideas about this concept. Much later in the 50s, we see that she is guiding other people that how to do that. And here she is talking about the elementary ideas. So these two are my reflections here. Yeah, thank you, Jishnuji. Very helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, anyone else? The, you know what how we talk about getting lost in the stories how we are always you know everything seems so different that that happened to me this person said that or when we hear other stories how intrigued we get or how surprised and yet how in this prayer mother is so simply saying that just one reason that my identification is not complete so all the dramas of our life, if we can, you know, see, bring it back to its roots. She's saying it's just one that she could see. Because otherwise any disturbance would be impossible for me. And uh, I uh, actually just... I smiled when I saw that line, you know, how she says, my progress is slow because we are always a bit strict with ourselves, right? Or a bit always that thing is there, okay, am I doing enough? But then the other day, you know, Ajit Sunmala, she said that if I had to choose the animal that I could identify with, uh, she said I would choose a sloth. So I was wondering, but if she chooses a sloth, you know, where does that leave me? And now mother is saying that, you know, my progress is slow, very slow. So 
one wonders you know that okay <laughs> like i don't know how to put it into words but again she ends with that i hope that in compensation it may be lasting and free from all fluctuations so it doesn't matter what at i mean it does matter but and yet it doesn't if you are taking your time and living thing i don't know what to say yeah that's it i think thank you yeah thank you so much and yeah good uh, to reiterate this thing uh, that the only reason just striking at the root of all disturbance is that my consecration is not complete my identification is not complete and getting back to the task i think uh, one in one way people may say that it's not a task it's an undoing but i think it's just a word play, word play because it is a task it uh, we have to constantly as uh, jishnu ji was also pointing out that uh, in whatever degree possible for us we have to remember and offer and again and again disidentify from the surface ego consciousness and identify with the presence of consciousness with us the eternal consciousness rather than the surface movement and this has to be done like a task before it becomes effortless so i think that's uh, very important because many a times we can be very passive and mother says that this is not a passive surrender that we do it's an active process so actively noticing becoming conscious of my yet my identification with my surface movements my opinions my thoughts my story lines as the was sharing you know, my people in my life you know all that moves basically <laughs> thoughts feelings sensations my identification with them causes me again and again uh, this uh, very soon from pleasure it turns into pain and the very reason is that i am not yet stabilized in my identification with the eternal consciousness so it's like a slippery slope which we can follow in any moment and if we are not vigilant if one is not sincere immediately this by the by default it is identification with the ego consciousness that's by default so if i had to change that default i will have to put in some effort and that's why agni or will or aspiration has such important role in the beginning mother says that the personal effort of the sadhak remains important for a very long time before a complete turnover over, over takes place which for us where we are right now i believe you know it's a, it's a long process yeah so one has to be at it one cannot sulk down and because in any moment of non vigilance uh, by default we can be sure that it's the ego consciousness in operation the sticky self in operation that's by default any laxity takes us there like a slippery slope and then the moment we are awake whether because of a disturbance or a suffering or a pain or a turmoil or a confusion immediately to recognize to wake up from the slumber and again begin the stabilization process in completely slowly in degrees identifying with the eternal consciousness so i feel that this is a very long process and i don't uh, see any any where soon when we can say that okay i am done i am stabilized in eternal consciousness long way for each one of us to go and to that point that um, saint kabiri says that as long as one has breath in the body that long one has to be vigilant because the ego consciousness can strike back any time so it's a very slippery slope indeed and as uh, in buddhist verses they say that the supreme companion is uh, mindfulness and alertness so i think that has to be really and one has to take i think joy in it because otherwise this long journey won't be possible you know just like we have uh, whenever we are on a long journey you know and if we have a good friend along with us it doesn't matter how long it is even if we get stuck on the way it's joyous and we can you know have fun on the way so i think like that we have to be really good companions to our own self and also enjoy Uh, whatever process or path we have chosen for ourselves 
because if joy is not there delight is not there along the way then it's very hard to uh, go on since there are turmoils and difficulties in between but if the company is joyous if I, mindfulness alertness i'm enjoying mindfulness and alertness it gives me delight i think then we will put effort so yeah i feel that delight and joy and fun has to be there along with all the sincerity seriousness also on the path but uh, also fun i believe uh, joy and fun has to be there for us to go on and on and on yeah and i also feel that when uh, we hear just like taru was pointing you know when we hear that masters saying that my progress is slow i think it's also very hu uh, humbling for each one of us and for them also and i i think that we the more we go deep into our own sadhana each one of us in various degrees we realize that oh my god you know, there is no end to the stabilization and one also sees that how slippery the slope is again the moment vigilance falters even for a moment as mother says we are again in the domain of thought and forest of feelings and all that and we see that still a lot of stabilization identification with our presence of awareness in other words eternal consciousness or say for example just constantly being with the mother there we see that there is a long long way to go because then we are also becoming conscious of these gaps in between which where we are not fully consecrated so i think it's beautiful to have uh, this idea that my progress is slow because then parallelly i'm also seeing that oh my god there are so many spaces uh, where i'm scattered still and there is so much scope and which i feel that it can also bring delight for us because we are employed forever as if the whole life we have some employment so on the although on the you know superficial things i may not have a job <laughs> but i will always have a job because there is this job of identifying with eternal consciousness which is yet not completed it's a pending task while so many other tasks become so important in my life so yeah i i think it brings delight also that we have something to look forward to each day of our life each moment of our life and i think this mission that mother uh, talks about grand that i may accomplish my mission i think this uh, in one of the ways which i can think about it is that this is the mission of each one of us to identify with the eternal consciousness is not only the mission of masters who have come but also our own mission that's why mother shurobindo again and again set our inner compass right while we think that the mission is having a settled job settled property settled wealth and i don't know what settlement means and everything should remain settled but we forget that we have to actually settle with the eternal consciousness i think that's our major task only task if one can say and rest everything is secondary things may come and go relationships may tear apart you know lots of turmoil may come in my life but i think in front of this mission that is there everything is just secondary just secondary an integral manifestation so each part of our being mind life emotions feelings the body consciousness which may again take a longer time but each part of the being turning fully to the divine fully and if we look at our status right now we will see that oh my god you know we haven't even started maybe so we can say okay my progress is slow because we see the journey that lies ahead in front of us so i think this is very humbling to hear it from masters that what they must be seeing in front of them that they are saying my progress is slow yeah so i won't go again uh, one line by line because ajishnu ji taru and i think we already reflected over it so and those of us who want we can again go over in our silent contemplation yes jishan ji monika ji one <coughs>
one anecdote which I remembered. So this uh, Narad holds, at least he used to hold one satsang in um, Oroville on the Tuesdays, I think on the Tuesdays. And there he was talking about this aspect of finding the psychic being. And I remember he said that is the task of lifetimes, yet it is the most, most urgent work ahead of you. Most urgent and immediate. That is, it is a task which we have to do over lifetimes, but it is the most urgent and immediate work which we have. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely agree. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I think it's almost, as you said, immediate, urgent. You know, one feels the urgency of that. Otherwise, you know, we, we were talking and we were just uh, looking at how we live and what kind of horrible, really horrible nightmares we create in this life lived with an ego consciousness. So absolutely. And not only at a fa family scale or an individual scale, it's like it translates into this global phenomena of living in ego consciousness and what horrible, horrible, really horrible nightmares we have created for ourselves. So, yeah, could not agree more. So I think in front of that task, you know, everything else is secondary, you know, eating, <laughs> our meals, our sleep, you know, our clothing, our whatever, you know, a, a roof on our head. I think everything else is really, really secondary in front of this task. If only we can just remind ourselves because we forget how many times, no matter how many times, we have to remind, putting pictures on the wall, you know, just flooding the home with books. Wherever I look, I see mother, you know, anything that works for each one of us, where we can uh, work with our forgetfulness of losing this sense of urgency that is there. I think Taru had shared something, uh, I can't remember where, uh, Taru, if you remember, you uh, please correct where you were sharing that mother shares somewhere that that is the only thing which can, which is enough to save the world. Something like that. I think maybe in Friday study, you were sharing something by the mother. I think that that was also connected with this urgency, this identification with the true self. wanted to add that uh, yeah yeah uh, urgency uh yeah it's true that it's urgent but having said that i think the urgency applies only to us right the work is all on us no yeah on, like others around. absolutely so, yeah absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes, so, yes it's urgent and yet you know all you have to do is work on yourself yeah yeah, yeah. and i think parallelly i i believe that parallelly just igniting uh as we are on the path of ourselves, I think igniting also this light uh, of aspiration to find our soul and unite with it in as many receptive people as possible, because why not? You know, when I go to invite someone for my wedding, you know, I beg and compel that, please come, you are my best friend. So why not compel in this aspect also? So I think uh, we have to also, especially for people who are receptive and uh, open and porous uh, to this influence, why not to forge ahead and why not to spill even this ignition, one can say, because uh, the more people are there, just like when we are planting trees, you know, people who are very activist about planting trees, they want more and more people must plant trees because it is, you know, good for the whole planet. You're not doing just just for yourself. So just like that, finding soul and uniting with it, it's beneficial and helpful for the whole of planet. You know? So we are not doing or spreading the cause just because I want something out of it or I want to be right. So I think why not if we can compel someone to come for a party <laughs> that you are my sister or brother or whatever, you know, please come, you have to come. And there we don't give up. So why to give up even there, here? That's what I and parallel is yeah. and un, totally understanding that yes, the task is with me all the time. Yeah. So, what does mean? Uh, like you said, relatives. So, relatives in Sanskrit or at least in Bengali is Atmya. 
Sorry, uh, please say it again. I said the relatives, as uh -huh. you say, relatives. So relatives uh, in Bengali, at least, and most probably in Sanskrit also, it's called Atmiya, Atmiya, right? So Atmiya is somebody who is close to soul. Atma, somebody who is close to Atma. That is the true relative, meaning of the word relative. I mean, not the relative in the English way. <laughs> in, like Alokda says, uh, relatives are all relative. So, yeah. <laughs> good one. <laughs> I'm saying in the Sanskrit way, the true meaning of the word. Beautiful. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, anything more, anyone on this uh, prayer? Shall we move on? So we have time and let us take up this another short prayer also. Uh, it's a beautiful little prayer. Not that little but because we have in prayers and meditations even shorter prayers. So can't really call it little but yes, in front of the previous one, a shorter one. So March 25, 1914. Uh, would anyone like to do the honor? Reading? Yeah. yeah, Monica, I'll read. Yes, please. Yeah. Silent and unseen as always, but all powerful. Thy action has made itself felt, and in these souls that seem to be so closed, a perception of thy divine light is awake. I knew well that none could invoke thy presence in vain. And if in the sincerity of our hearts we commune with thee through no matter what organism, body or human collectivity, this organism, in spite of its ignorance, finds its unconsciousness wholly transformed. But when in one or several elements there is the conscious transformation, when the flame that smolders under the ashes leaps out, suddenly illumining all the being, then with the joy we salute thy sovereign action, testify once more to thy invincible puissance and can hope that new possibility of true happiness has been added to the others in mankind. O Lord, an ardent thanksgiving mounts from me towards thee, expressing the gratitude of the sorrowing humanity, which thou illuminest, transformest, and glorifest, and givest to it the peace of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so inviting reflections. Yeah, anyone? Okay, so I'm assuming nothing at the moment. I'm going to then read it and we can take it step by step. Silent and unseen as always, but all powerful. I think the first line itself, uh, where we see that usually the action of ego consciousness is very aggressive. Uh, it wants to be validated. It's not usually silent and unseen, <laughs> mostly. Yeah. <laughs> It always wants to be seen. I think that's the characteristic of our ego consciousness that one wants to be seen, whether as a victim or whether as you know, someone else. It doesn't matter where we are in the hierarchy, but 
uh, one wants to be seen or one wants to be seen that I am so unseen. I think that's also part of it. That I am so rejected, neglected. Again, uh, one wants bad validation. So, but the powerful divine action, Mother says, silent and unseen, as always, but all powerful, omnipotent, as they say. Thy action has made itself felt. And in these souls that seemed to be so closed, a perception of thy divine light is awake. So I am assuming that uh, this is in continuation, of course, uh, with the previous prayer. And Alugda must have substantiated upon uh, who are the people she's referring to, but not going into that detail at the moment and taking in what is there for us right now. I knew well that none could invoke thy presence in vain. And if in the sincerity of our hearts we commune with thee through no matter what organism, body or human collectivity. So two things mother are sharing. Either we do like a mechanical ritual or do it with the body like we do all over. Uh, we have so many religions where we do perform something. So mother is, I think this is a very fail safe mechanism in one way that if one invokes divine presence, it cannot be in vain. So mother says that I knew well that none could invoke thy presence in vain and if in the sincerity of our hearts we commune with thee through no matter what organism, it could be body or human collectivity, this organism, so mother is referring, one organism is the body and then the other organism mother I believe is referring to is this collective consciousness. You know, when we, for example, there is a crisis on India and we collectively rise up and pray to the divine, you know, something like that. So human collectivity, this organism, in spite of its ignorance, finds its unconsciousness wholly transformed. So I think this is just also very powerful because the act of prayer itself, the act of invocation itself is a purificatory process. And we have seen in our lives that no matter whenever we have really, really intensely prayed for either a material issue or mostly we pray for material issues or something inner. You know, we see that it works like a purification process. So the, we don't, now we are, no, nothing is bothering about the result of the prayer. The prayer itself is the result because the moment I am in a prayer mood, we will see that we feel so purified, at least in that moment. You know, intentions are purified, ill will is purified. We may change again, you know, we may fall back into the older track again. But the act of praying itself, the act of invocation of divine itself, in whatever ignorant way one is doing, that itself, mother says, in spite of its ignorance, finds its unconsciousness wholly transformed. How what can be more beautiful than this fail safe mechanism that you know i don't even know how to pray i don't even know if i'm praying for the right thing okay it doesn't matter just this invocation of the divine presence that there is something higher than me which knows better which knows which is overlooking just that invocation i think does the task and mother says that ir irrespective of whatever ignorant state one finds its unconsciousness wholly transformed. But when in one or several elements, there is a conscious transformation. So, you know, for those of us who do conscious wanting of disidentification with the ego consciousness, whenever anger is arising, we are disidentifying. You know, we want to transcend anger, we want to transcend jealousy. So all the elements are under a conscious supervision. When in one or several elements, there is this conscious transformation. When that flame that smolders under the ashes, 
so this flame of purification smolders you know most of the time we are not in very active surrender mode it we are, we are in a dull mode mostly it's very rare to have a very active and vigilant surrender throughout the day there may be days but then there are days which are very dull which are kind kind of subconscious unconscious uh, we can call so mother says that when the flame that smolders under the ashes leaps out suddenly illumining all the being so suddenly there is a transcendence happening in one element or the other element you know we transcend one limitation we see that you know i could have fallen into that trap but i did not i remained with the mother so in one or the several elements one of the several elements mother says that if that smoldering that simmering that is going on like very slow progress that we were talking of and suddenly there is this illumination of one particular element then with joy will salute thy sovereign action i think this place we all have touched we may not remember all of us and some of us may remember more vividly than others but this place we have all touched we have all had glimpses of where we have actively invoked a fire of purification or something you know some good will has been invoked and we have seen the result in either as a purification of thought or transcendence of some jealousy some ambition some desire you know transcendence of some bad emotion some disturbing emotion that is arising so there in joy we salute thy sovereign action one feels like also a gratitude towards the divine that uh, the divine grace help me transcend this little uh, whatever phase was there testify once more to thy invincible two sons i think uh, it's power if i am not wrong i don't know exact reference to invincible would be uh, uh, that which cannot be it cannot be dead you know it's like invincible that which cannot be defeated sorry not dead but uh, all powerful as mother was saying in the first sentence so all powerful the moment we invoke the moment there is an aspiration is there and because of that aspiration and this conscious transformation as mother says some illumination we see in one or the other element then we are able to testify once more to indefeatable undefeatable invincible power that can hope and hope can hope that a new possibility of a true happiness has been added to the others in mankind so i think not only in us because the more we we are able to transcend our own limitations we also i think find a lot of joy in delight in others Uh, transcending transcending their limitations uh, where you know i often refer to this uh, uh, little comment uh, short passage by shri aurobindo in isha upanishad where he is talking about how devadatta and harish chandra and how in the success of harish chandra when devadatta who does not have that much of material success then i rejoice in that success i am actually identifying with my divine consciousness which is one and the same in either devdatta on or harish chandra so when this action takes place when we are able to testify once more to divine power that yes it's it's working it's it's like consciously in front of me it's working usually it's working silent and unseen and we can hope that a new possibility of true happiness why true happiness because our happiness is very momentary and fleeting you know a person smiles at us at, at us we are happy a person calls us we are happy the person doesn't call i am disappointed you know i lo- lose a job i am disappointed so our happiness is like this but true joy true happiness is when we are fun with the divine and if we are on the path at least we are attempting this union you know, i i was uh, again reflecting on this uh, mother's mantra which shri aurobindo has given Om Anand Mai Chaitanya Mai Satya Mai Padme. So when we really truly aspire for true delight, Anand, true consciousness, Chaitanya, and true truth, Satya, that we can find in the divine. 
that we find whenever we are truly with the mother, not wanting anything but being with the mother. There we have the delight, we have the true happiness, and we have consciousness and the truth. So mother says that new possibility of true happiness then has been added to the others in mankind. It's like an offering that has been given to each one of us, that is possible for each one of us. So, O oh Lord, an ardent thanksgiving. So when we see this happening in front of us, this transcendence of our limitations, transcendence of our ego consciousness, O oh Lord, an ardent thanksgiving mounts from me towards thee, expressing the gratitude of this sorrowing humanity. No, we are so troubled. We are troubled mostly. And if we look around, if we, we were talking of relatives, we look about around other families, so much of you know, turmoil we have created living in this ego consciousness. Too much trouble we have created for ourselves. So it is indeed a sorrowing humanity. Too much trouble. And when we see this transcendence happening, owing to uh, this conscious transformation or illumination of at least one or the several elements, then mother says, this thanksgiving, this gratitude arises that thank God, what a relief. We, we are safe. <laughs> when we look at sorrowing humanity, you know, we, we are safe because you are there. You know, as mother says that looking at Sri Aurobindo, when, when we you know, when there is a prayer, when she says that, uh, who, who I have seen today, if he is there on earth, then for sure the divine victory is certain. So that kind of gratitude. So, O oh Lord, an ardent thanksgiving mounts from me towards thee, expressing the gratitude of the sorrowing humanity, which thou illuminest. So there is only one light, that light we may get from a book, a teacher, a master, from anywhere. There is only one light shining through all the lights, which is the divine light. Thou illuminest, transformest and glorifiest and givest to it the peace of knowledge. So along with whenever there is illumination, there is light, there is clarity, there is wisdom, there is love. You know, these are all, they come in a bouquet, all of these together. So the more we unify ourselves with our true self, I think these are the gifts, free gifts that we get. <laughs> you know, just like we get return gift that we, uh, when we go to somebody's birthday party. Mm -hmm. Little kids are often looking to those return gifts. So these are our return gifts. Even if we are looking, uh, although most of us won't be looking for return gifts because the journey itself is joy, but these are our return gifts. More love, unconditional love, more knowledge, wisdom, that knowledge which is not gathered through books, a knowledge which is a constant flow from that eternal source. Clarity of mind, simplicity, lightness of mind. So light, transformation, glory, and peace of knowledge. And when we have that larger picture, when we have that larger wisdom, then we are at peace. You know, then even when difficulties arise, we don't trouble ourselves because we know it is happening for a reason. So with that divine knowledge, which shines in the being, there is peace. We are in mostly non-peace because we live identified with our ignorance. The moment even for glimpses we have that true knowledge, true clarity, we have that peace. You know, all of us have a taste of that. So the task is then what we were sharing earlier. The task is to stabilize that identification in whatever way suits anyone. To stabilize that identification with the eternal consciousness and constant disidentification from the ego state from the limited sense of self. Yeah, so said enough. Yeah, any more reflections, anyone? So Monika, one example comes came to my mind when you were talking about, uh, when we were reading this mother's prayer, that 
the prayer as a rule of purification. So I remembered that uh, during World War II, and so we all know right, that Churchill before World War II, of course, he stands for anti-India. He had many faults. But when this World War II happened, he was the only person among the Western leaders who understood what Germany stands for or the this uh, Germany and the fascist stand for. And he was the person who convinced America that you also come to war or you support. That is, in his own way. And mother said, and Nirod Baran said that Churchill is not a right person or not a good person. And mother said, right. But surprisingly, he has been chosen as the instrument of the divine and he is responding to it very well. He has risen up on this occasion and he has he is proving himself to be an instrument of the divine. So that that example came to my mind. You know, that despite his faults, his problems, his other things, and to the extent that Shurabindu used to keep a keen attention on his health. He used to, if if Churchill has pneumonia or something, Shurabindu used to read his, or, I mean, pay attention to his health reports, which were published, to protect him, basically. Mm, that's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, anyone else? Anything? I have a question. So, Jishni Ji, uh, in this context, uh, what does it imply? I didn't get the essence of it. Yeah, Jishnu Ji, would you like to respond? Sorry, I couldn't get the question. Shweta is asking that uh, the anecdote that you shared, yeah. in the context of the prayer, how does it... Uh, Okay, so what I was thinking is that irrespective of the quality of the irrespective of the quality of the person, okay, there are moments where when this uh, divine force or divine touch is there, that he is <clears throat> and mother said that Churchill is having this phase. She she spoke to Nirad Baran and said, This is a phase. Right now he is behaving like this. After this. Maybe he will come down to ordinary level and once again, he will become ordinary. So what I was thinking is when I was, when uh, Monika ji was reading this prayer, that the divine touch, it is that the divine touch, divine force, whichever we say, that elevates all the qualities of a person or that elevates a person to a different level, which is much beyond his ordinary level. I mean, today, if we see there are so many, if especially people who study history, there are so many leaders of that time, but Churchill stands ahead of them because of the decisions he took at that point of time. And despite that he has done very, very wrong things about the colonialism, other things. It is like because he chose himself or rather he chose to be receptive at that point of time, like all his sins were pardoned. That is how I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's yeah, just forgiven himself, if you think. Yeah. I think other at other points also, Mother has shared that she knew of people, uh, the divine touch that you were talking of, where when they were in communion with the divine, they would be just like, you know, working like a genius. And suddenly when the divine touch is lost, they're back to their, you know, the ordinary consciousness. So, yes. Yeah. I mean, if we can see about artists and uh, singers, performers, that some of their performance, some of their uh, even speakers, some are extremely good. Yeah, yeah. Because they have, mother is to say that they have forgotten the result at that point of time. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. In play of Vital, no? Vital is now aligned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to maybe uh, lastly, yeah, are there any more reflections? Please, anyone, if you have, keep sharing. In the meantime, I'm just going to put something on the screen. I just have one comment. Yes. You no, know, in the uh, prison, uh, uh, the prison book, I'm sorry, I forget the name. Uh, right through your window. Tales Story of Prison of Life. Prison life yeah, or something. Yeah. Tales, so sorry, yes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, in that, in it, you know, at least that is what I remember. There's this thing that you know when he's being told that 
you know you can do the work when she or obindo is told that you can do it he is straight away also parallelly told that don't think you are the only one who can do it you know if there are so many who are ready and this is special it's just you know if you, you it can be done through you or it can be done through somebody else that kind of a para was also there so again it's not about you know who you are it's about whatever grace whoever grace has chosen to you know as an instrument to take it forward like vishnu you know vishnu ji was saying that it's just that once it's there the power or what you become at that because that's a divine power like you know nothing personal nothing individual so that was again very surprising to me that sri aurobind was said that you know you can choose not to do it and it's fine there are so many yeah thank you yeah yeah very relevant thank you yes. i think this is very uh, good <laughs> because you know there uh, there is this uh, i was in last i don't know which session i was sharing about this story uh, there is a book uh, the return of the prodigal son uh, by henry mm-hmm. noven and in that uh, it's like a very metaphorical story also we have a picture by rembrandt also uh, on this uh, particular story where there is story of a of two sons and uh, one son leaves the father and he ha- he says that okay give me your property i'm just uh, like very uh, superficially telling the story so there are two sons one son says that give me the you know property my share and i'm going to do whatever i'm going to do with this uh, my share and then he goes and you know throws away the money on women and wherever you know he just loiters around the money and becomes really in a bad condition later on while the other son who stays with the father and uh, obedient like he's a very obedient one and you know does all the king that king wants him to do and stays there in the palace along with the father now this son who is gone lost and loitered around all the money now he's left with nothing and he realizes his mistake now when he realizes his mistake uh, he goes back to the father like one can say you know like when we consider ourselves a sinner you know even then we go back to the divine you know who do we go back to but the divine so the father uh, the love on the father's face when he receives the son is boundless like he has no problem with him committing all the sins that he committed but he's just boundlessly with love and so much emotion is receiving the son that at least at least you came at last you came doesn't matter now along with that there is also the story i am actually aligning it with what taru was sharing because the son who stayed with the father he felt that he was so special so there was this again this sense of i am more powerful or i am more pious than the other one and he felt resentment when he saw and jealousy when he saw the father receiving that son who had committing sins committed so many sins being received equal love and even more love so i think that's what um, it's like a large metaphorical story for those of us interested maybe they can get the book and read but i think that really shows that for the divine we are all just his children or her children all equal like terrorists criminals it doesn't matter you know, who we are we are all children of the divine so there is no more dearest child <laughs> or you know uh, no less dearest child we are all dearest child of the divine and at times that may really hurt the egos of those who can who, who would say that oh but i have been so insincere you know look he has been so insincere all his life now he's coming back and i don't get any special attention you know so we are still in the ego game and uh, still can uh, kind of get deluded i think in that and again one has to transcend that delusion and know that we are really all equals no matter wherever we are so yeah just got reminded of that when you shared that shiro bindus and it thank you so much okay so yeah anything more anyone
okay so in that case uh, thank you so much for being here and sharing and reflecting together and happy practice everyone thank you for joining thank you monica thank you thank you for the beautiful session thank you bye